you to be finding the book of Exodus, if you would. Exodus chapter number 20. And I want you to uh, also be finding Ephesians chapter number 6. Exodus chapter 20 and Ephesians chapter number 6. We have been uh, looking these days uh, at seven life-changing words that can revolutionize your home. Seven life-changing words that can revolutionize your home. We've looked at words like love. Uh, we've looked at words like forgiveness. We've talked about truth. Uh, we've talked about the church. We've talked about commitment. We've, we've talked about uh, several words that if, if we'll put into practice in our life and we'll do what the Word of God says concerning these words then it very well may have a dramatic, dramatic influence and impact on our homes. And the last word that we're going to look at is the word honor. The word honor. And we're going to be dealing a lot with uh, our young people today, uh, but uh, it's really a message for all of us. But uh, it may seem like I'm... Uh, dealing more with the young people than I am with anyone else. But uh, in reality, if we think about the message, every single one of us in here this morning are the product of uh, man and woman. We're a product of parents. A uh, man and a woman came together and conceived us. So it's really a message for all of us. And I, I'll get to all that in a moment. But uh, I was reading this week uh, about a newspaper editor that decided that uh, for about ten weeks he was going to print one of the Ten Commandments, or, or for about ten days he was going to print one of the Ten Commandments uh, for those ten successive days in the local newspaper. And at the completion of his listing of the Ten Commandments, after the tenth day, uh, he got a letter from one of his readers and the reader said, please cancel my subscription. You are getting a little too personal. Well, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get a little personal. Our text this morning, especially from Exodus chapter number 20, comes from two different sources. It comes uh, from the Ten Commandments. And then as we'll look at the end, it comes from Paul's writings. Now, as you know, uh, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses by God on two tablets of stone. Uh, those two tablets remind us that the commandments, the Ten Commandments, deal with two vital relationships in our lives. It deals with our relationship to God, and it deals with our relationship to our fellow man. The first four commandments, as you read them, will deal with man's relationship to God. The last six commandments, as you read the Ten Commandments, deal with or relate to our relationship with our fellow man. And listen to me, these two belong together. Why do you say that, preacher? It's because you can't be right with God if you're not right with your fellow man. Amen? And you'll have a hard time being right with your fellow man if you're not right with God. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in His teachings, He summarized the Ten Commandments like this. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. These two great sections of the commandments hang together. Our relationship to God and our relationship with one another. But listen, they also tie religion and morality. Now, contrary to what America thinks today, contrary to what our politicians think today, contrary to what the world teaches today, listen, you can't have morality without a Christ-centered religion. Right. Not just any religion but a Christ-centered religion. And I just believe that there needs to, uh, to be a return to teaching some kind of morals and values in our schools today. Amen? Yeah. 
I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for uh, release time. During the school day, our kids are able to sign up for a class in uh, one of those periods. They're able to board vans or school buses or uh, church buses and go uh, to a church or to a designated place off campus during one of their, uh, their class periods. And they're able to study the Word of God. I'm grateful this morning for the Good News Clubs for our children. You know, several children, many children have been saved at a Good News Club. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, one of my nieces were saved at a Good News Club. And so I thank God for all... The, I'm very thankful this morning for those in our school systems who are Christian. Amen? I look around our congregation and we have several in our congregations who in our congregation who are teachers right here in our community right here in Pickens County. However, we can't assign our schools an impossible task. You can't teach morality apart from religion. So many years ago, what's happened is we, we kicked uh, the Bible out of school, then we threw prayer out, and when we threw prayer out and we threw the Bible out, listen to me, the morals and the standards that we're supposed to live by, they just followed right on out the window. Listen, you, you can't teach right from wrong apart from the truths that are revealed in God's Word. If it's truth, it's God's truth. Amen? If it is truth, it is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. And so these tie together religion, our relationship to God, and morals, our relationship to one another. Now another truth you will notice is this. In these Ten Commandments, God has given, quite clearly now, God has given us basic morality. Basic morality. Now today, uh, there is a great deal of moral ambiguity. That just means that, that people today in our contemporary society, uh, uh, there's uncertainty. There have, have questions that have been raised about what is right and what is wrong. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. May be okay for you, may not be okay for me, and vice versa. Who gets to determine what's right? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Listen, when you read the Ten Commandments, you quickly understand that God has given some moral absolutes. Things that will not change. God has established acceptable human behavior. Not only for thousands of years ago, not only for today, but God has established acceptable human behavior for all of time and for all of eternity. And so that gets us back to our text in Exodus chapter 20. We're talking about honor today and the importance that it plays within the family. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, you're there. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now I want you to notice this morning the importance of this first command of the last six that deal with our relationship to our fellow man. The first commandment of the, of the last six deals with others. Honor your mother and father. Listen, the first others we ever run into as a child is always our mom and dad. That's the first others we ever meet. So we need to learn to get along with our parents. Amen? Don't care how old you are, you need to learn to get along. Amen? If I can't get along with my family, then I'm going to have problems getting along with everybody else in society. And so here's the money statement this morning. The family is the basic structure and the basic foundation of human civilization. Why do you think the devil fights so hard to redefine what the biblical traditional family looks like? He knows that it's the basic structure and foundation of human civilization. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to kill, steal, and to destroy. And so he gets us to try and redefine marriage. He gets us to try to redefine what uh, a traditional family looks like. But it all begins right here. Honor. 
Honor can revolutionize your home and the family dynamic if you allow it to. We're going to look at two truths this morning and we're going to finish up tonight. And I don't want you to miss tonight because you need to get the last part of this message. The first thing that I want you to see this morning, very quickly, I want you to notice the parents of this command. Honor thy father or honor thy mother and father. If you're a parent in here today, raise your hand. If you're a parent, raise your hand. All right, listen to me. I want you to think about being a parent. Think about being a parent this morning. Three things about being a parent that I want you to focus on. Number one, being a parent is a biological matter. It's a biological matter. Mothers and fathers are the reason that you and I exist today. We did not have a thing in the world to do with choosing our parents. There's no choice in the matter. God chose them for us. Kids, listen to me. You didn't get a vote on your parents. You didn't win them in a contest. You could not order them off of QVC. Your parents may have more hang-ups than the phone company, but listen to me. They are yours. Amen? And I want to remind you of something this morning. Our parents didn't get to choose us either. <laughs> They didn't, certainly didn't win us in a contest. Uh, for, all, for all we know, our parents went to PTA meetings under an assumed name. They, they assumed name. They didn't. You got them and they got you. Now listen to me. When we were conceived, there was another person there. And it was God Almighty. And the Bible says in Psalm 139, hear me this morning, every person in here today understand that you were no accident. There are no accidents in here this morning. Absolutely none. The Bible says in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So uh, young people, adults, God gave us those parents. That was His doing. So birth and parenthood are a biological matter. That means as a parent, I'm responsible for the physical well-being of my children. Biologically, I gave them life. Now I have the responsibility to guard them, to care for them, and to meet their needs physically. We have someone in this world who loves us and who is interested in us. God has given every child a superb gift. Parents who grant them the gift of life. So, so parents are able to give their children a quality of life that no one else can really offer them. They give them the gift of experience. I was reading this week about a daddy who told his daughter, he said, listen, tonight you go on that date, your curfew is 11 o'clock. And so she began to argue like teenagers always do. Dad, you just don't understand. Dad, I'm not a child anymore. And he thought about that and he replied, I know you're not a child anymore, so let's make it 1030, amen? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, young people, your parents have been down the road you're traveling. They tell you certain things and they give you certain guidelines because they want to save you some heartache. They want you to avoid trouble. And the fact that they've been down that road means that they can give you helpful advice. They can give you counsel along the way. And I believe that's what every parent ought to do. You know what? I'm 44. I'll be 45 in April. And I still go to my dad for counsel. Still go to my mom for wisdom. We ought to give our child the benefit of experience along the way. So, so being a parent is a biological matter, but second of all, it's an emotional matter. It's an emotional matter. It's not enough to simply bring children into this world. Hear me this morning. Being able to produce a baby does not qualify you to be a fit parent. Being able to produce a baby biologically does not mean that you're qualified to be a successful parent. There's an emotional responsibility when it comes to parenting. Think, think of it like this. It's almost as if someone has placed a rare jewel in your hand. The world's most costly jewel has been placed in your care. And, and you have been asked to engrave one sentence on that jewel. You engrave something on it. Be very careful what you write because it will be engraved on that jewel for the rest of its existence. So when God gave you a child, He's placed a precious jewel in your hand. It's the costliest possession you will ever have or ever have the privilege of having. And I promise you, on that jewel, you will write a sentence. 
You will write a sentence by the way you live your life, by what you say, by what you teach, and how you act toward and around that child. So be ca very careful, moms and dads, what you write, because it will stay with them for the rest of our lives, or their lives. What our young people become emotionally, to a great extent, will be what parents have engraved upon their psyches. And so we have a responsibility to love our children, to give them emotional support. We're to lead our children. So being a parent is a biological matter. It's an emotional matter. But third of all, it is a spiritual matter. Now please hear me this morning. The first concept a child has of God, they learn from their parents. The first concept a child has of God is learned from their parents. We as parents, we're a skylight. We're a prism through which a child sees his first view of God. What an awesome responsibility parents have. The Bible teaches that parents are to be the spiritual leaders and teachers of their children. Thank God for preachers. Thank God for teachers. Thank God for churches. Thank God for Sunday school. But listen, the basic responsibility for the spiritual training of our boys and girls lies at the feet of mom and dad. Now I challenge you this morning, and, and I've told you this before, my family certainly is not perfect, and this is one of the biggest battles that we have at our house trying to do this consistently. But I want to challenge all of us this morning. If we don't have a family altar at our house, we need to institute one. A family altar. Where we gather together as a family and pray together and study the Word of God. We need to do it while they're young. Amen? You see, when they get old enough to go off on their own, they're not going to stick around long enough for a family altar. But listen, if we start it while they're young, it may stick with them. Hopefully it'll become a part of their adult life. The Apostle Paul addressed some of his letters to the churches in your house. I wonder if Paul could say that today. The church at your house. We desperately need a church in our house where mom and dad pray together and study God's word together with the family. The University of Chicago did a study among its graduate level students and found that the majority of those students got their clearest teaching on morality and values and view of God from their parents. Parents, our number one responsibility in life is not to make a bunch of money. Our number one responsibility in life is is not to run the nation's largest corporation. It's not to train our child to be the best athlete in the world or the prettiest beauty pageant contestant in the world. Our number one responsibility in this life is to lead our children and to point our children to Jesus Christ. They can be the best athlete, they can be the prettiest, they can be the most popular, but if we have not led them to the foot of the old rugged cross, if we have not led them to the feet of Jesus Christ, all of that other stuff doesn't matter. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We've got a great responsibility. So, so there's the parents of this command, and here's where we'll finish this morning. Notice the precept of this commandment. Flip on over to Ephesians chapter number 6. You've got your finger there. Ephesians chapter number 6. Notice what the biblical writer Paul says here. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And your fathers provoke not your children to wrath. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Underline that word, honor. Honor thy father and mother. Colossians 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is, the, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. You know what he's saying there? He's saying this is right. It pleases the Lord for us to honor our parents. Now, what does that word honor mean? It means to give weight to. It, it, it means uh, to hold in high esteem. And so right here in Ephesians 6, there's a twofold application of this command concerning honor and obedience of parents. The first thing is this. 
the matter of obedience. He says, obey your parents. This teaches how children are to respond to their parents. Obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, obey literally means to hear under. Hear under. It carries with it, listen to me, it carries with it the concept of authority. The children in the family are to answer to the authority of their parents. God has established authority in every realm of life. There's authority at school. There's authority in the government. There's authority out there in the community. And listen to me, there is authority in the family. When he says obey your parents, you could say listen to your parents. And so we need to teach our children the importance of obedience. Because in so doing, we are going to teach them to observe obedience in every realm of life. But listen, if we let them do as they please at home, and we let them run all over us, then they're going to go to school, and they're going to try to do the same thing. If they'll not obey you at home, they're going to go out into society and try to do as they wish. If they don't obey you at home, then one day when they go to work, they'll have a hard time listening to their supervisor. So listen, we need to hold them to the fire in this area when they are little, when they're just a child. Because I promise you, if we let them slide with disobedience when they're little, we think it's cute when they sass mom and dad. We think it's cute. We think it's funny when they're disrespectful and, and they talk ugly. We think that's cute when they're little, but listen to me, they'll, we'll have a hard time reining them in by the time they're 8 or 10 years old if we don't take care of it when they're little. Right. Young people, obey your parents. Do what they tell you. Listen to them. Obey them in the Lord, the Bible says. I told the early service, you know, when we talk about this and we say obey your parents, well, what if my parents tell me to rob a bank? Now, don't ask me a silly question like that. Bible says obey them in the Lord. Don't go against God's law. Obey your parents. And parents in here, you may say, well, well, preacher, I can't handle my young person. I can't handle my kid. What should I do? Well, every now and then, I'm just old school. Every now and then, you may have to take them to the woodshed. Right. Anybody know what the woodshed is? Raise your hand. The older generation knows. You say, preacher, what did you do with yours? I took them to the woodshed. Preacher, what did you do when they got older? Well, how older? I've taken away, well, I've destroyed phones. When they wouldn't obey, I've taken away privileges. You know what? Some today in our culture are more worried about being their child's best friend than they are about being a parent. Right. Kids need a parent first. If you believe your child's too old for corporal punishment, then do something that hurts much worse. Take away their cell phone. Take away their devices, their video games, their iPads, their Fitbits, their iPods, you name it. That most of the time will get their attention very quickly. Take away their driving privileges. You say, preacher, I can't do that. I, I have to get in touch with them. They have to drive to work and to school. Well, sometimes that's our problem. We're allowing them to run their lives and we're allowing them to run our lives. Hey, friend, how'd you get to school? How did you get to school? You rode the bus. Some of, you know, today we think, well, my kids are too good to ride. You know what? Sometimes it do them good to ride the bus. Amen? Yeah. Might teach them a couple of things. How did your parents get in touch with you when you were gone? Well, I know what my daddy did sometimes. He came looking for me. You know, sometimes, parents, we need to grow up and take some responsibility and set a good example in our homes of what a functional family looks like. Ask these school teachers in here. Ask the police today what they believe is the greatest cause of the rise in juvenile delinquency in our day. And here's what they'll tell you. Nine out of ten will say something like this. Lack of discipline. A lack of... If I ever thought about talking back to my parents or disobeying my parents or disrespecting my parents, I knew what was coming. Amen? Yeah. And listen, if you're a spouse in, in here today and, and you allow your child to talk to your wife or to your husband in any way they want to, you're creating a problem in the home. 
So we need to discipline our children or else we run the risk of raising that child to believe he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and how he wants. But I have news for you. He will live a life of heartache if that's his attitude. Honor your parents. And so parents, the responsibility lies at our feet to teach them respect. So there's the matter of obedience. And then I'm going to close with this. There's a the matter of respect. Honor your father and mother. Now, adults, listen to me. This commandment does not say honor them until you're 18 years of age. Right? It just says honor your... The concept of honor and respect goes well beyond the age of adolescence. It means you respect and honor your parents as long as they are alive here on this earth. And by the way, listen to me. There are no perfect parents. And if there were, only perfect kids could demand perfect parents. Now listen, you don't have to respect what they do. Everybody listen to me. You don't have to respect what your parents do. You don't have to like how they act. You don't have to condone what they've done. But according to the Word of God, you do have to honor them. Honor thy father and mother. Children normally pass through four stages in their relationship with their parents. Stage one, about ages four to ten, they idolize their parents. My daddy can beat up your daddy. My mama's better than your mama. They idolize their parents. And then around ages 11 through 15, they begin to demonize their parents. All the trouble in the home, all the trouble in my life is my mom and dad. They've caused everything. They don't understand me. They treat me so bad. I got to come in at 1030. I can't have this friend. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they demonize their parents. And then about ages 16 to 22, listen, they get a little crafty. And they begin to utilize their parents. Hey, Mom, can I borrow a car? You're the best mom in the world. <laughs> Honey, thank you so much for these flowers that I received at work today. What got into you? I just love you, mama. <laughs> hey, dad, can I borrow 20 bucks? Just, just 20 bucks. I mean, I'm going to go out and hang out with some of my friends. We're going to do Bible study and uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have a prayer time. Probably go out and get a get an ice cream afterwards. We're gonna wear our Christian t shirt and witness. You think I can borrow twenty bucks that sure, I'll give you forty for that. They utilize. And then normally around the age of twenty three and up, they humanize their parents. They grow to maturity and they realize that their parents are neither God nor the devil. They realize that uh, they're not things to be used, but humans who have strong and weak points just like themselves. Honoring your parents is always proper. Why is that? Because according to Paul in Ephesians 6, it's right. According to Paul in Colossians, it pleases God. According to Paul in Romans 13, it teaches respect for authority. According to Solomon in Proverbs 6, it places you under God's protection. It brings peace and joy to your parents when you do that. It helps you grow in wisdom, according to Proverbs 4. So I want to ask all of us this morning, how are we doing at showing honor to others? Romans 12.10, honor one another above yourselves. How can you go out this week and honor somebody? How can you honor somebody today? I mean, just, just honor them. Be a blessing to them. And then, are you honoring or dishonoring your parents? Have, uh, have we been treating them as distinguished or are we treating them as dirt? Do we consider their advice uh, and, and, and their role in our life, do we consider that as weighty or worthless? Proverbs 1, verse 8. I love the Proverbs. Proverbs 1, verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake the law of thy mother. 
James McDonald gives us some pointers on, on how to help us honor our parents, and I'm going to close with this. You know what we need to do? And hear me, and I know some of you, your relationship with your parents, older and younger, I know it's very difficult right now for whatever reason, whatever reason. But one of the ways that we can seek to honor them is to place great value on our relationship with them. We need to refuse the attitude that says, you know what? It just doesn't matter. This relationship just doesn't matter. It's not working. I continue to be let down. I continue to get upset. So really, it just doesn't matter. Yes, it does. It matters a great deal. Take the initiative to improve the relationship in whatever way you can. Take the initiative in trying to improve the relationship in whatever way you can. And listen to me, do that as long as it takes. And then do this. You know what sometimes we need to do? We need to recognize that our parents have done something right. Amen? They have done something right. They, they weren't always wrong. And then every now and then, we need to thank our parents for the sacrifices they've made for us. Forgive them. Even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Adults, are you honoring your aging parents today? Are you honoring them? Are you looking for ways to demonstrate care and concern? Listen to Leviticus 19, verse 32. Rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. Rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. Now I know a lot of times we have a message like this. And here's what we're tempted to do. We're tempted to go out of here and say something like this. Boy, my son, my daughter, they really needed to hear that. Boy, my parents, they really needed that message. But you know what? As I studied this week, Stuart needed this message. So let's not look at anybody else but ourselves. Let's look at ourselves and what we can do to make the word honor or to allow the word honor to dramatically change our home. Every head bowed, every eye closed.